Welcome, everybody. Um, is this okay? Is this working? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, so, welcome to Physical Game Art. How 3D printing can improve your 3D models. I'm Nathan Walker, and this is Lila Gibbons, and we will be giving this talk together, even if the app says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm actually on it now, so it's okay. not just him. Um, so, what are we going to go over in this talk? Uh, introductions, like who we are and how we got into 3D printing, uh, what is 3D printing, why are you here, and how can you add 3D printing to your existing game pipeline? Um, I mean, obviously we're going to talk about some other areas of where 3D printing is being used currently, uh, followed by some Q&A, and we'll also uh, bring up some frequently asked questions to save time. Uh, this is us. This is this is one hundred percent us. I hope it's us. <laughs> um, that's okay. I'll click it through. Uh, there will be a slight D and D theme to these. Just FYI, be prepared. Uh, so as I said, uh, I'm Nathan. I go by Nate. Either one's fine. Um, I've been working at Cerebral Fix since twenty twenty as a three D modeler. Um, I started out as a freelance illustrator, uh, working on children's book illustrations, logo designs, graphic design, um, everything 2D. Uh, very little 3D art when I first got started, um, until uh, I was presented with an opportunity. So as a kid, I always loved making things with my hands. I always loved tangible things. I loved things that like you could hold and play with and climb on. Uh, and probably break and destroy too, because that's always fun. Um, I would build tiny things out of clay. Um, I would build tree houses. My dad had a forge, so I grew up kind of like banging on metal, making fantastical weapons and, and all of that, uh, which led me to want to go to art school. Um, kind of took the long way there. I took, I think, eight years to get my bachelor's, went to seven different colleges, studied biology, environmental conservation, international studies, Japanese, you name it and also art. Um, always, there was art classes, um, but I was kind of torn. Um, studied animation, video works, uh, graphic design, you name it, but always kind of had the fundamentals there too. Drawing, painting, sculpting, um, it was always in my background. Uh, and when I graduated, there was an opportunity in, in a town near, be, near me. Um, also, I forgot to mention I'm from the States, in case you can't tell from the accent. Not Canada, everyone thinks Canada. Um, got an opportunity to do a public art sculpture. Uh, and it was great because it was like a contest and I won and I'm like, all right, this is legit. Like I'm doing stuff that I love and people enjoy it. So the middle piece was a giant ant that I made, made out of found objects. Um, there's a lot of like bits and pieces, some wheel hubs on the back. The head is actually made from an old uh, motorcycle gas tank. So it was kind of like trying to make my vision match what I could find. And that led to more and more opportunities. The crab on the, on the your left, my right, um, the back of it's made from an old VW bug. Uh, the claws are made from like motorcycle hubs um, and just lots of gears and bits that I found from like local scrapyards. And it's in front of a children's museum, which is great because I love children's books. So it was kind of natural pairing. Um, but I always loved toys and um, tabletop games as well. I always wanted to make my own tabletop game. And that led me down the path of, I should make my own pieces. And then I was like, how the hell am I going to make my own pieces? So I started doing some online classes to learn um, 3D software and landed on ZBrush, which I loved. And that was a nice segue into 3D printing because seeing it on the screen is great, but holding it in your hand is even better. So it kind of gave me that background of like making tangible objects. Um, and the experience with ZBrush and the experience with other softwares led me to be able to work in the game industry, which was great. Um, wasn't what I went to school for, but CFIX was amazing and they kind of got me up to speed. So taking my art skills and kind of meshing it with that digital side um, let me do what I needed to do for the job. And I think Lila is up next. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Um, so I'm originally from Hokuteka and I originally studied for film and animation. So not games at all. Uh, so I've been with Cerebral for three, five years now, and I was originally hired as a junior product owner. 
So along the years, I've jumped around in different roles until finally settling as a 3D artist, um, with some of my work showing up there. And I didn't get into 3D printing until this guy kept talking about it, and then I got really interested about it and loved the idea of I can print something I make. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, and then I got more into D&D, and of course I did D&D minis! <laughs> like, it's just so cool! We're going to talk more about it later, though. Um, so, what is 3D printing? You guys are down. Yeah, no, it's okay. okay. Um, so, oh, I gave my notes. 3D printing, or additive manufacturing, is the construction of a three-dimensional object from a CAD model or a digital 3D model. It can be done in a variety of processes in which material is deposited, joined, solidified under the computer control, with materials being added together typically layer by layer. In other words, it makes a 3D model by building it up in different types of layers, which we'll get into more later on what different layers are. And here are just some images of what it looks like. We all wish it was the fast one, but sometimes it goes really slow. Um, and here are just some really cool examples of what 3D printing technology is being used. We've got a cup made out of chocolate, and we can also 3D print meat, which is... Anyway, we've got people using it to make custom shoes, so we can uh, utilize and repurpose recycling and custom fit feet. We've got people using it to construct houses out of concrete so we can go to very remote locations and do really fancy smancy architecture. We've got what's very popular in the cosplay community using it for very fine tuned parts that are quite strong. A very popular example is the Iron Man helmet where they can put small gizmos in the sides and just whoop it open. Um, the medical industry is also using it for, in this example, a cast. So instead of having a really heavy plaster, it's a super lightweight but very strong, breathable cast. Um, and here's just a fun picture of Weta Workshop having a very, very, very big printer that they are using for props. And I found out they have multiple of them and I want to see them. Uh, so why this talk? That's you. That's me. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, why why this talk? Um, I guess a because I love three D printing, but then trying to find a way to make it work in the game world. Uh, so recognizable characters. These things are iconic. They stand out. They're beloved. Um, we know them. They are they are great examples of game art. Um, how do we make them even better? So there's a process. We start with. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I feel like I'm loud enough, but okay. Um, there's a process. We start with 2D concepts. We, there's, you know, start to finish. We, we have like many, many steps. This is just a small, you know, sample of some of the steps involved. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually kind of convoluted, but you get the idea. You know, you, there's many iterations. You're starting with concept work. You're doing revisions. You're, you're getting feedback. Uh, you're moving into blocking your, your 3D models out. You're moving into high poly, getting some detail, more reviews, more revisions. Uh, then once it's ready, it's time to start mapping your UVs, getting your texture and your poly paint done, more reviews, more revisions, moving into low poly, getting it game ready, integrating testing, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of effort and a lot of time that's spent on making this art um, as, as good as it can be. So for me personally, I feel like 3D printing would be a nice way to add into this because if we're spending this much time anyways, why not add another tool that can kind of make our art as, as great as we can make it? So we start with the concepts. We start with 2D. Um, again, D&D trigger if anyone's offended by D&D stuff. Uh, 2D process. Um, so every year there's a, a competition, not really a competition, but a show, uh, Mermaid. I don't know if any of you guys do Mermaid. Um, it's basically just make a mermaid. Um, and I don't want to do anything that I'm told, so I'm like, I'm going to make a weird uh, chimera mermaid. So anyways, we start with the, th the thumbnail. We start looking at our, our shape language, our volumes, our, our overall repetition of form, um, and then we refine, refine, refine until we get something that has nice lines, uh, some nice shading, uh, some details. So this is kind of like a quick step by step through the process of, of 2D. But even at that phase, when it's done, when we think it's ready, when we're happy with it, there's still you know things we can do. There's still checks. There's still um, ways we can make it better. So in this case, 
I was like, okay, it's great, it's fine, it's done. But when I flip it, suddenly the arm that's closer to me feels a little long. And I don't know if anyone else notices this, but for me it was like, okay, this doesn't feel quite right. And I didn't notice that until I reversed the image because it kind of tricks our brain, it resets it, it lets us look at something fresh. So I make my changes and now I'm happy with the changes. Um, there's tons of things we can do to check, change, test, iterate our 2D work. Um, there's, there's books and volumes and, and so many things. You can go from color to black and white to check your contrast. You can look at your overall shape language. You can check anatomy. You can play with line weight. Uh, the list kind of goes on and on and on. So these things exist for 2D. And you know everyone knows them or uses them or can incorporate them. But what do we do for 3D? We can do some of the same things. We certainly can look at them and kind of like flip images and change contrast and, and do all the 2D tricks. But since it's 3D, it kind of feels like there's room for growth. There's room to try new things. Um, again, D&D, &D, um, we played with uh, a bunch of friends of mine for years and years and years, and we had a mascot. It was a, a mimic. It was a little jewel crab. We loved it. I loved it. It became my pet. So I'm like, I'm going to make a model of this thing. So this is one of the first things that I actually 3D modeled in ZBrush. And obviously I loved it and I rendered it and I'm like, it's great. I got to print this thing. As soon as you get a printer, you print everything. You can't not. So this is one of my first prints and I was thrilled with it. Like it was actually a tangible object. It was like, it was like my baby. I could hold it and it was a magical moment. Um, but the magical moment kind of faded a little bit because I'm like, ah, it could be better. There's some things that I could change. The eye stalks felt a little wonky. The legs felt a little too thin. And the main thing was the body felt a little convoluted to me. There was like two big shapes overlapping. And I'm like, you're kind of losing some of the shape language, some of the cuteness. So I did an iteration 2D, um, did some sketches, refined the sketches, and then re-sculpted it in ZBrush. And then printed it again. The image on the left is actually a, a rendering key shot. So it's going straight from ZBrush to key shot um, to make it as, as close to real as possible. Uh, and then this is the printed 3D version. This is also came up here. If anyone wants to come up afterwards, there's a much larger version of him. Um, and I was thrilled. I was much happier with the, with the finished result. And I don't think I would have gotten here had I not first printed it and realized there were a lot of things that I could do to change. Um, just to note, there's a base on it because I gave them as gifts to members of the D&D of the group so I could write little things on the bottom. Uh, another project of mine this was just a self-assigned portfolio piece. I'm a huge fan of Marvel comics, everything. Uh, Scotty Young, specifically, one of my favorite artists. So I was like, all right, I'm going to model one of his covers. And that piece is also up here if you want to come up and see it later. Uh, and then this is the finished print. Uh, this is on a PLA, a filament printer. It's done in multiple pieces. Obviously, it wouldn't fit on this printer. It's bigger than the printer. Um, but I wasn't thrilled. I was like, okay, I love it, but I want to do something more. And it wasn't again until I held it and I looked at it that I was like, it might be fun to make kind of like an action hero sort of figure out of this kit bashing bits and pieces. Uh, I also really love the helmet, and I felt like the helmet was kind of getting hidden in that particular pose. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to like put the helmet on present it prominently. Again, went to ZBrush, redid it. Um, I printed two versions. Both versions are here. I just had room on the print bed, and I thought maybe I'd make duplicates. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a small and medium. Um, printed them out. Again, loved them, thrilled. So cool. And again, that kind of faded really quickly because I'm like, the arms are a little too long. The, the legs are too short. They're too squat. Um, it just didn't have the right balance. And I didn't notice that uh, in, the, in the actual digital rendering. So again, back to ZBrush and you'll see the changes and it's subtle. It's not a huge difference, but for me, it was like, you know, as an artist, as artists, we tend to like fixate on like the last 10%. Like that's when we kind of make or break our models. That's when it really shines. And for me, like this, this just came across much better. Um, I haven't had a chance to print the new version. Um, so maybe I'll change it again. I don't know, but for me, it's, 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 it was worth the effort. Uh, so, other reasons that you might want to use 3D printing in your pipeline. As I mentioned, holding something in your hands, actually getting it printed is just an amazing feeling in general. Like it, it just, yeah, it rocks your world. But when you actually have something that you can hold and manipulate, it's so different than actually just looking at something on the screen and trying to get an idea. Like I find myself when I'm sculpting, sometimes leaning like this and I'm like, oh, right, I can turn the, turn the model. 
Um, but when you actually have it in your hand, it's the same thing when like you bring in, like when you're a kid, you bring in a toy to school and someone says, can I see it? And the first thing to do is they reach their hand out. You know, it's not, can I see it? It's like, can I see it? And like, you have that tactile immediate imprint. You're just like, this feels right. This feels cool. Or, you know, maybe it feels wrong. Like maybe something feels off, um, but you have so much information that you take in just from touching things and like moving them around. Um, so we did talk about that. Uh, yeah, I jumped the gun a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, yeah, so the viewing angles is part of that touching thing. It's part of that manipulation. It's part of that moving around. Um, it's part of that uh, real life experience. Um, but if you're not looking at it, if you're just kind of using your fingers, you can feel things that are maybe off. Um, if, if something's supposed to have a nice taper, if something's supposed to have a nice line, you can kind of feel those little idiosyncrasies that you want to go back and fix. Lighting and backgrounds. Uh, rendering software does a great job of like mimicking real world situations, but it can't do everything. It can't, um, it, it can't always get like the subtleties, like shadows. Um, if, you take, if you take a model out into the sun, if you take it into a dark room, if you move it far away, closer to you, flip it around, uh, try it on a day like this when it's like full of moisture in the air. Like how do these things read? That's another good check that you can do to see how this thing's gonna read. Um, if I had a model that's really far away, is how is that going to read in a game? Like, if I can see it from across the room and recognize the shape language, maybe it's a good design. Um, and I might not get that full experience in looking at just a screen. Uh, continuity is, is a great one, too. Um, if you print something out and you have it on your desk as you're working on something else, does it feel like it's part of the same world? If you then print out another model, another model, another model, you now have this family of things that are supposed to feel like they're part of the same game. Do they have similarities? Do they have repetitions of, of shapes and um, patterns and textures and whatnot? Or conversely, does it feel separate? Like if you've got you know, the hero and the villain, like do they feel different enough? Um, having those things right on your desk around the office is a great way to kind of check those things. Future game inspiration, that's another thing, like having these things around, uh, obviously you can use them to do checks, but just having that inspiration of like, I made this, people come in and see it, they love it, they talk to me about it, um, it's going to inspire me to want to make more things that are equally as great, like having someone be like, wow, this is so cool, is amazing, having your own thing that's like, wow, I made this thing, like, it, it kind of like drives you to want to make more things of that similar quality, if you just have things in a folder, on your desktop, hidden away, it's not, it's not feeding back into that loop of like being proud of what you, what you make. When I was an illustrator, I had a, a teacher who said, you know, sure, we have to make things for our client. We have to fit the deadline. We have to fit the expectations of what they want, but also you have to have some like measure of pride in your work too. And I think having things around and showing them off shows that pride and kind of like feeds back into us as artists. Uh, and then lastly, um, you probably all know about photogrammetry, but it's basically taking pictures um, using either like a, a phone or even like a LiDAR system or something and scanning your images or scanning your 3D objects. And you can, you can take these things out like this. This model, um, I spent way too much time sanding it and painting it. Um, and because of that, I could actually like scan it and bring it back into like software and, and manipulate it and use it as a, a game asset. Um, and you can do that with any model. You can scan your stuff back in, sand it down. You could take bits of clay, add things to it, manipulate it in the real world, and then bring it back into the game, which I think is kind of a fun way to like bridge that gap between real and, and virtual. Um, yeah, so that's just, just a few reasons that 3D printing could definitely help your, your pipeline, I think. And I think I get to take a speaking break, so. <laughs> So now that we've convinced you to get a 3D printer, <laughs> um, what do you need to know about getting a 3D printer and what's the differences? Well, let's start off with talking about, well, what do we have? So Nate here has a Cure wash machine. I'll tell you what that is later, don't worry. Uh, we've got two resin machines and a filament printer. So two liquid printers, one thing that feeds a stick in it. Um, and this is kind of the outcome of work that Nate does. Um, as you can see, it can be quite a mess, so don't do it at your desk because you'll just get plastic everywhere. Um, and you do need a lot of 
room. Uh, for me, I just have just the one resin printer and a filament printer and a very cheap, like $80 uh, cure station because I didn't want to spend like $300 on a really fancy pansy uh, uh, cure machine. Um, so mine is literally a shoebox and tinfoil, a solar panel that like turns the table and a UV light. But that's all I need and I'll tell you why soon. So for me, I get a kick out of making practical things that I can use in everyday life. Like I keep losing my Wacom pen. I'm going to make a pen holder so I can stick it on my tablet so I don't lose it. Or if I'm feeling fancy, I can put it in my print that makes it look like a rocket ship. I've also got my card holder. I've got a laser. I've also got my card holder. So that way I can not only see my cards, but I can shake it around and not lose them. Um, and then in our second lockdown, I wanted something uh, mechanical and engineering to help build this really clunky tablet stand. So that way I'm not always bringing my tablet out, plugging it in just to draw like a few things and then packing away and put it aside. It's like, well, I have this computer monitor stand thing. All I need is a PVC pipe and a brain to make all these components next to it. So all I got to do is just swing it out, do my drawing, swing it back, and it's a second monitor. It later died because my clamps were too tight and I broke my screen. <laughs> um, but it was mine, it wasn't works, so that's the important difference. Um, so how does printing work? So a filament printer, which is the one where Groot is on, is done by uh, spinning around in circles, moving the bed, moving the nozzle uh, until it makes a print. Uh, a resin machine is a bed that goes into a, essentially a pool of resin and it emits a mask underneath it, a black and white mask. And whatever is white is what the light will go through and that will set the resin. And it just keeps doing that like thousands of thousands upon layers until you get your final print. Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so, like I said before, this is Nate's cure machine. And this is specifically for resin. You don't need it as for filament printers. Because with resin, because it's so fine-tuned, there's sometimes going to be resin, resin, resin residue. <laughs> Got there. Um, just left on the print. So, we wash it first in isoprom... Alcohol. <laughs> I can't say the word. Um wash it all out, and then when it's done, we take the bath out, we put the model back in the turntable, it spins around on the UV light, and it sets it. Well, why do we set it? Because it's still squishy, it's still fresh, so we need to harden it. So, yeah, I made a cheap version because the resin I have, I'm able to just rinse it under water. Um, for me, it works way better because I didn't want to set up an extra station um, just to hold an alcohol that could spill with a very large pop. I don't want that knocked over and spilling. So what exactly is the difference in resin and filament? So personally, resin print is really nice for like your D&D minis that have really like fine-tuned details. And it does take a while to print, but the results are nice. I mean, we've got examples up the front. Uh, where there is a filament printer, yeah, I could do the same thing, but you can see like in this section, I've lost all the detail because my nozzle's too big for it to print. But a filament print is still really good for big models, unless you're this guy and you print these things in these huge scales, and then, it, I mean, you've still got less sanding, but there's more sanding in a filament printer because you've got to sand out all the lines in, in between. So that way the paint doesn't get absorbed inside it. And then you've just wasted three cans of spray paint filling a model that's not giving you a final result. Um, so what do you need to know for the environments for these printers now? So you need a well-ventilated room, more so with the filament printer than the resin one, because generally a resin printer has got a lid and it's encased, but you still need to wear gloves when handling it when it's done. And if it's not well ventilated uh, and you're con 
temperature is not consistent, like the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, um, you get this really fun situation where your prints start to peel off the bed because the temperatures are fluctuating, they can't stick to the bed, and now you've just got a mess. Um, you need a stable and level bed. Yeah, you need a stable and level bed. You don't want to walk past it and then like move something and knock something and then get more of a mess like this. And ideally, you keep it out of reach of pets and children, so don't put it on the floor. But then you can also get hairs in the fans. You get hairs in the resin batch, and that can also just ruin your print. Unless you're going for a really hairy print, but I wouldn't recommend. Um, but any more in-depth details for safety will obviously be in the safety booklet they'll come with it but these are just some very high levels do I want resin or filament make sure you have at least these requirements all right now that we've convinced you on what print to get how do you break down your model so you can print it so a few things to keep in mind is a how big do I want this awesome statue B when I do break it down how's it going to stick together so examples of this will be um, we make little pegs because if you have two prints and you stick them together with I don't know super glue um, they're just going to eventually just snap apart because they don't actually have anything to grip onto so you're much better having rivets or divots or in this case pegs just to give it that extra bit of contact and um, just difficulty to move so it doesn't snap out of place. Some people use resin and they cast UV light onto it and call it done, but you won't be able to get the resin that's close to the center. Just, well, you can't reach it with UV light because everything else is on the outside. Um, a great example that Nate's done is, what was the character called again? Which one, the other? No, the gray one. Oh, the gray one was the Iron Heart. So with the Iron Heart one, because he broke his um, model down to fit on his printer, You've got the head as one piece, but it's got a peg inside the head and the same as the body, so that way it's much more stuck together. When it comes to, say, screwdrivers or practical uh, pieces that you want to use it for, you really need to think about the directionale of how it's going to be printed. And screws are a great example of how to explain this. If you have a screw with a thread on it and you just print it up like this one here, it's going to turn into a spring when weight is on it. So you want to print something like this diagonally. That way it's using the whole length as your structure and your support. Um, and when you're doing, say, a resin print, if you're doing a flat object, this is something I've learned and I'm still learning. Nothing I say is a gospel. There's probably other ways of doing things. This is just how I've learned how to do it. But when I'm doing a flat object, I need to have it on a 45 or a 35 degree angle so it's actually flat. Otherwise, it will bow. So, speaking of bowing and making sure things are flat, I've got my model ready. I've got it broken up into pieces. How do I tell the printer to print it? So, you use a slicer. So there's two types of slicers because different printers need different types of code. For a filament printer, you would convert it to G-code. And G-code is, I'm going to start in this position, and from here to here, I'm going to extrude this much filament out at this temperature, at this speed, and I'm just going to keep doing that around and around and around with all these coordinates that you've given me. Yes, it's confusing. Um, other things you need to consider when using a slicer is my print going to stick to my bed because you don't want it just lifting up and just completely screwing your print. So we're going to add some extra feet to it. I can use this. We're going to add some feet to it. That way it's going to be nice and snug on the bed and not move at all. With a resin printer, because it technically prints upside down, you need to consider, well, if I'm going to print this axe, how's it going to print in mid-air? So this is where we use something called supports. So that's what all these fun little orange lines are. This is so it helps keep the model in place where it's building all the layers. And I should explain what layers are in resin. 
So in a resin, instead of using G-code, because it's just taking a snapshot of every single layer, creating a mask, it needs to know also where the supports are for it. So like I was saying earlier, resin is done by literally slicing the model into millions and millions and mi no, not millions, thousands of layers. Man, millions would be big. Um, until it gets to the final result and sending it to the resin printer and it will just print magically and it's amazing get a resin printer that's fine <laughs> um and they'll also automatically add a base to it to stick to it so while this model is pointing this way up it will actually be flipped in the machine itself hey, hey it's you <laughs> cool uh okay so we've all got our new printers we all know how to use them uh, we've all integrated them into our art pipeline. What else can we do with the printers once we have them? Um, and some of these are probably self-explanatory, but I'll go over them anyways. Uh, you can actually use them in the game themselves. Things like uh, Disney Infinity, uh, Nintendo Amiibo. They use tiny little toys with NFC chips in them that have a reader. So you've got something that you've made from your game physically, and you can actually interact with the game with that piece, which is really cool because um, you've got them and now you're actually using them in the game. Uh, collectibles and statues, again, another way to kind of inspire yourself, inspire others. Also to sell, um, if you have a fan base, it's a great way to like continue that sort of brand loyalty. Like people want to collect things that you've made and if you have actually things you can sell or auction or whatever, um, that's a great way to do it. And then lastly, the actual controllers themselves. A lot of people have been building their own controllers. Having a 3D printer is a great way to do that, iterate it. Um, even just like adding skins onto ready-made controllers, you know, on the left we have a bespoke kind of like really cool um, textural surface that they put onto the faceplate. And then on the right we have someone who actually like designed a uh, joystick apparatus, which has got all sorts of really cool like mechanics that tie into the game. So there's a lot of options you can do besides just making like cool artwork that kind of like helps make your art better. You can actually make tangible things that kind of supplementary, supplementarily, yeah, that's a word, uh, support your, your, your IP or your game. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. Okay, so we have some quick uh, facts to throw out at you. Um, what printer is best and cheapest to start with? Uh, the answer is like anyone really, but you wanna find something that has some good reviews. Um, there's, there's a ton of th uh, printers out there. Um, just doing a search for printers. Um, you know, I found that Creality, Prusa, uh, Anycubic, um, those are kind of the big ones. There's a lot of ones you can get as kits. There's ones you can get that are already done. Um, no matter which one you get, there will be some fine tuning you'll have to do even just to get the print to come out well. And then there's also maintenance that might be involved, but that's kind of where printers are. They're not 100% like plug and play, like they are to a certain extent, but you will need to do a little bit of, you know, maintenance and just kind of like upkeep, which is kind of fun because you're troubleshooting a little bit. Um, but for me, like my first printer was like a Prusa and I wanted it to just work. I didn't want to have to like deal with anything. I was like, I'll pay the money, like make it good for me, please. Um, <laughs> and that's what I did. Uh, um, next question. So I'm not a 3D artist, but I have a really cool printer and I want to print things. Awesome. There are websites that you can also go to. Or if you want to print something for your phone, I've done this. I've made my own case for my phone by getting a model a 3d model of my phone with the exact specifications to it so i can make room for buttons uh so we've got my mini factory thingiverse you wrote this thanks yeah it's a weird name. okay it's a website I promise. uh printables and many more you can even commission a 3d artist to melt model you a model and you can print it on your own machine the possibility is endless um and i can vouch for some of these because i've actually made models that uh, because they're fan art, I don't feel like I can sell them, like, legally. Um, so I'll give them away for free. And it's kind of like a way to be like, here's something that I'm giving away. But it's also a, it's also a way to, um, it's almost like a, building a portfolio, like getting people to follow your creations. And I've had so many people be like, oh, is this model ready for, like, download? Can I download this model? Please, please, please. Um, and it's awesome. It's really cool that people just want to, like, print your stuff. Um, so, yeah, so anyways, that's, that's the, the website spiel. 
Uh, I feel like we should have been hiding these because we're just giving away the answers yeah. before I even tell you. Um, I already have a printer, but want another one. And you don't have money. Guess what? You can print your own. Um, yes. There Obviously, is, there's... There's actually a guy in here that has done that. Uh, if you want to stick your hand up, you're welcome to, but I won't point you <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you did. So it's on you. Yeah. Um, uh, early adopters of printing technology were all about, like, getting that first printer up and going and then printing parts to make your own. Um, there's obviously pieces that you have to buy, yeah. like rods and circuitry and stuff, but a lot of it can be self-replicating um, and they will take over the world, so be careful. Um, I mean, just build a printing farm then, and then you can build a business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Easy. Uh, but I think that's it for the stuff that we want to throw at you, but if you guys have questions, please uh, shout them out. Someone uh, got a mic here? Got a mic. Oh yeah, and a microphone, <laughs> I guess. That's, Sweet. That'll work. Uh, so I saw this hand go up first, I think, so we'll start Ooh, that Next question. Very important and serious question. Okay. Would you download a car? <laughs> <laughs> download and then print it? <laughs> I mean, Formula One races are looking into 3D printing their engines because they're able to fine tune the exact thresholds to make better engines. And because they can just print the extra pieces they need if something breaks, yeah, it's yeah. a thing. <laughs> yeah, you can literally print in rubber, metal, plastic. Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, I think wood? glass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's wood PLAs. So, yeah, you technically could for sure. Yeah. But also, you know, but would you? I... <laughs> she would. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, when you're cutting up models for printing and getting them ready for uh, print, are there any considerations you have when you're uh, slicing them up and whether you have to leave extra room for when you're reassembling them again? Yes, uh, all of that. So I try to hide my um, keyed areas along natural seams. So anywhere like an arm will meet, uh, legs, heads, like if you can hide the seam, that's best. Um, one trick that I learned is I, I use Boolean a lot. So I'll make a really flat shape and use it to cut like a, a gap and I make it as thin as possible. But then the key itself, I will make an object uh, that's keyed. So it's kind of tapered. And then the part that has the piece attached to it, I'll leave as is, and then I'll make a slightly larger version to cut out the recess from the piece that's gonna go over it. So you do wanna keep like a tiny buffer. It's definitely an art form, um, trying to get that just right. There will be invariably be some sanding, especially when you print on the print bed. Sometimes you get what they call the elephant foot where it kind of flares a little bit. So you will have to do a little touch up here and there. Um, but yeah, those are some of the considerations to, to take into place. And then like Lila said, like making sure that it's on the, the print bed in such a way that it prints well. Um, I know uh, if you go to my website, I have a, a, a gargoyle sculpture that I did. And there were so many like organic shapes that it was hard to get any flat surface to print on. So it was kind of like finding the flattest of the rounded shapes to be like your, your base. Yeah. And right at the back. It can also vary on what printer you use too for how much threshold you need. True. 3D printing is pretty cool. Um, yeah. Every resin printer I've dealt with has been an absolute joy. And every FDM printer that I've dealt with has been uh, <laughs> uh, bad, bad, just a yeah. bad time. So like if you're dealing with this in a studio context where you're trying to introduce this into the art pipeline, how would you deal with the fact that your FDM printer is very likely to become like a huge time sink just maintaining its ability to print, let alone Get printing the things you need. Yeah, uh, do you want to address it or you want me to talk? Get a new one. Um, sounds like it might be something that might just be out of date or... Yeah. So, yeah, so I think uh, regarding like FDM, so FDM is the one where you've got a hot end, you've got a lot of mo moving pieces, you've got the chances of clogging, you've got belts that can stretch, you've got leveling issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a consideration. The, the upside is the material is cheap, the machines are usually cheaper, they can print faster so you can see the results quicker. You can make things bigger so you can kind of like see things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see in a smaller scale. So there's some definite pros to it. But yeah, the upkeep, I can, I can vouch for that. I've, I've, I had, the one that I had worked great for like six months and then it slowly needed to have some things tweaked and replaced and changed. Um, and that just comes with like the, the fact that it's still kind of newish technology for the consumer. 
So you have to take that into account. The other side is if you have a resin printer, sure, it works pretty easily. It's just kind of down, up, down, up with a light. But you have to make sure that you're dealing with like the chemicals because you've got resin fumes that are always going to be present. So even if it's a water based one, um, they make bio resin that's less toxic, but you still need to kind of like vent that. And then the washing and, and curing can be kind of a, a thing where you have to have a special room just for that. So there's definitely pros and cons to each. Um, and if you don't want to get a printer, there are services. There are places you can send your files to and people will print for you which is a valid option. Some of my first prints, I did that because A, I didn't have a printer that was great and I didn't have the experience and I, it was for a client. Um, so I was like, hey, I'm happy to pay, you know, a little bit more to have someone do all the legwork for me. Um, I don't know this. So this model here. Uh, so this guy is from uh, Final Space. Um, so I have the full body and I have all the parts and I made multiple arms with weapons and everything. So see in the back. Um, <laughs> So this was actually uh, printed for me because I didn't have a resin printer at the time and I wanted it to be really smooth. So there's a YouTuber, uh, Uncle Jesse, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen him, but he does great reviews of every printer available. And I was like, hey, I've got this thing, can you print it? And it was like a hundred bucks. And he printed like, you know, two heads this size, a body, a bunch of arms. And yeah, I could have done it for cheaper, but like he took care of all of the cleanup and got rid of, you know, he sliced it, he did the whole thing. So it was well worth the price. So that's another another option is to like outsource if you need to. It's just nice to have that in-house because you see it immediately. There's there's no wait. Oh, lost hands. Working with resin, we're obviously using toxic chemicals. Do you have any tips on cleanup on that side of things? Mm -hmm. You can first swat. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I actually also only use a water-based um, resin. And so I always use gloves, obviously. Um, I try to keep it outside in a garage setting. If I print it inside, I make sure the door's shut and the window's open. Um, I have big vats of water where I do my rinsing in. So I'll like put a vat underneath the hose, rinse it off with a brush, um, wearing goggles and stuff. So all the excess resin goes into a vat and then you just put it in the sun and let it cure and then it becomes inert. Um, and then you can just actually scoop the plastic out and throw it away. Um, or if it's a, a bio one, you could compost it feasibly or possibly. Um, and then the water is fine because it's, everything's been baked. So there's, there's no residue, but yeah, it is, it is, you know, it's still a, dangerous material that you don't want long-term exposure to so you don't want to be in the room while it's printing um, you want to keep all of your containers like nicely secured and not dripping and leaking and i had one where i opened the box and it just spilled all over the floor and it was a nightmare um, it was a lot of cleanup uh yeah i'll grab this one first uh sort of a double question with the with the, a filament printer if you have a, a large space that's hollow you can put support structures in mm -hmm. quite readily um, but i imagine with the resin printer because it needs to cure with light from the outside that could be more difficult and dual question here how deep or how thick can you actually make the walls on a resin print yeah so i have seven answers for you <laughs> awesome <laughs> uh yeah so so wall thickness is important um you can actually, like this one actually has supports inside of it. Um, and the resin does cure as it's being um, printed. It just doesn't get as much exposure as it does to get fully hard. Um, if you use a translucent resin, which is uh, the um, Iron Man, Iron Heart sculptures, they're translucent, so light will penetrate. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Um, also cutting it uh, into pieces makes it a little easier to get access to those kind of nooks and crannies. Um, but yeah, technically, if you don't need a support, you don't have to add a support. So it's best to try to avoid them. Um, filament's less of a concern. You can actually fill it all the way if you want, which is stupid. Um, one of my first resin prints uh, was a tiny little figure and I printed the body section and I used like, like 500 mils of resin. I'm like, what the hell? And then I realized, oh, right, it's solid. I printed a solid block of resin. Oh, uh, yeah. And it actually makes it weaker and it doesn't print as well. So you want to have that hollow body because it, um, it makes it stronger and, and prints a little nicer. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. You can actually get UV flashlights and shine them in if that was a concern. Um, eventually it will cure over time too, just naturally. Um, so as long as it's all sealed up on the outside and all cleaned and you don't have any openings that will leak, 
which you know everything I do, I, I usually at least put a coat of like um, primer paint on it. Um, then it's basically not going to be a problem. You're not going to get any resin on you. Yeah. You can also still print in uh, clear resin, and it's best to print clear resin kind of solid. But if you're doing really big objects, you need some sort of vent hole. Otherwise, there won't be any room for excess resin to come out of. Yeah. And you still get a really nice result. But it's just like extra steps you have to consider when doing it. And if it was something that you wanted to make collectibles or, or toys that you were going to sell, um, I've got into uh, mold making. So I have my first model that I then will, you know, make a silicone mold and then cast in plastic. And then there's no concern because that just cooks itself. Mm. Yeah. Good question over there. Cool. Um, yeah. Do you ever look at the model in VR before, like, printing it out? I just, I just look at it in R, <laughs> like regular reality. <laughs> You could theoretically, though, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I had a comparison, but I've, I've never, I haven't done it yet, but I would love to. Yeah. Good question. Yep. Uh, is there any uh, preparation you need to do before you paint the models, or is it straight out of the printer? Sanding. Yeah, sanding. It depends on what your end use is. If you're making something that's just utilitarian, then it doesn't matter. But if you like, um, like the the model that's closest to me, so much sanding. Um, yeah, so it's it's usually for me it's like a rough sand with like a sixty grit, um, and then spray paint. I usually go to an art store to get the actual. Uh, did you bring the prints? Do you have the print copies? I do. Okay, cool. So we have actually I, I printed out um, uh, some tips for like actually finishing your your models, um, and you're welcome to take them. We have a bunch of them. But yeah, so I'll spray paint it to try to fill in those gaps, sand it again, spray paint it again, sand it again. The only problem with that is eventually you start to lose detail because you fill in gaps that you don't want to. But I've got a ton of like tiny little um, needle files and small sanding devices to try to get those details back. But as soon as you try to paint like, you know, like this eyebrow, if this was print, uh, printed in filament, you would get tiny little lines that the paint would kind of like seep into so you wouldn't have that nice crisp edge. Uh, which again is why it's really nice to key everything. So if like I made this eyebrow as a separate piece, just paint it, stick it in, and it's like perfect. Um, it speeds up the process, but it also keeps your your line definition nice and crisp. Yep. We'll probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. More questions. More questions. Hello. Um, so you mentioned before with. Um, putting in like struts and stuff on the inside of models and making sure that you're not printing them as like solid pieces. Um, is that something that you are doing? Um, is there like a software that does that for you? Or are you having to like go in and do that? Yeah. Do you want to take that? Um, it kind of depends what you're using it for again. If you're purposely making it hollow because uh, that's what you want your model to be say functioning or how you want it to look then you can be doing that in your 3d modeling program otherwise in your slicer program you can say make a hollow have the walls gay thick yeah there's uh there's some software uh lychee slicer and cheetah box are both um free or relatively free and uh they're really fun because you like all the orange uh, support you saw in some of the earlier photos it's basically just like click and drag and then you can like build lattices and it's it's almost like building a tiny city it's like mm -hmm. It's, it, I don't know, I, I kind of enjoy it. I mean, I just hit the auto button and it just does it for me. You can do that. But um, you can also save those um, build supports for D&D &D, um, destroy structures. Yeah. No one's going to know. <laughs> and when you when you flip your model upside down, it'll show you the lowest point too, which is great because then you can like support, support, support. Yeah, uh, yeah um, I wonder like with all the um, supports and stuff, those are like extra material that you don't use. Um, do you just throw that out or does they do they get recycled or, or... I sell mine as abstract art <laughs> Killing. otherwise yeah we throw yeah. them out um, but if you don't have them you can also ruin your print which means you have to do another print anyway so for the little amount that you need for the supports because they don't take that much uh, extra reason like I don't know about you but for some of the prints that I've done as like cents worth of resin mm -hmm. um, they just don't use that much. So for an extra like 0 0.001 of a cent for some supports, yeah, I'll take that. And real quick, uh, if you do a filament filament print, um, the one that's got the extrusion, that stuff can be recycled. Um, mm. You can buy your own like auger machine that will melt it back down into a filament, or you can ship it to places and they will like 
remake filament out of it, which is pretty cool. Or you can be really, really, really fancy and get like Sprite and Coke bottles, break them down and turn that in. You can, you can make it into filament. Yeah. But it's a lot more tedious, toxic, and expensive. <laughs> but totally <laughs> worth it. Yeah, a lot more expensive machines to get there, but the fact that Plus you can... Plus free soda. Well, I mean, you gotta drink it first. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Is there any more questions or? Guess we're good? No? All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah.